Thank you for being a part of that exercise and the quiet and the thoughtfulness that surrounds it. Today it's also my pleasure to introduce our speaker. The Reverend Dr. Amy Schifrin is the director of the North American Lutheran Seminary and is on the faculty of the Trinity School for Ministry in Pittsburgh. Dr. Schifrin earned her Master's of Divinity degree from Luther Northwestern Theological Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, and her PhD in Liturgical Studies and Homiletics at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. She served as a parish pastor uh, throughout the Midwest and in Saskatchewan, and has been a campus pastor uh, during her storied career. Uh, we're blessed to have her with us, and as a deep friend of Westmont at all that we do. Amy, please come. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to our chaplain and the campus ministry staff. Um, I've been here uh, once before to preach and a few times to visit, and I always feel deeply blessed by the students, the staff, and the faculty, and the beautiful geography that you have as well. I bring you greetings from the students at the North American Lutheran Seminary and Trinity School for Ministry. Like Westmont, we are an interdenominational ecumenical gathering of Christians, a graduate school. And uh, we have specific tracks for Anglicans, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, and Lutherans, yet our students' uh, population runs wider than that. So if you are discerning a call to ministry, check us out online, and, um, or send me an email. My, my address is on there, and I'd be happy to correspond with you. And I pray that many of you are discerning calls to ministry in the world, because the world is so in need of God's love. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God of all goodness and holiness, you have watched over your people in every age. Come to us now again as we hear your word, that as the words are spoken, you may also be reading our hearts, and that you would bring forth from us lives of praise, of goodness, of holiness. In your name, amen. The passage that I have chosen uh, for our meditation today is from the book of Leviticus, the 19th chapter, verses 1 and 2, and 9 through 18. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. When you reap the harvest of the land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the alien. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. And you shall not lie to one another. And you shall not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not defraud your neighbor, you shall not steal, and you shall not keep for yourself the wages of a laborer until morning. You shall not revile the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall not render an unjust judgment you shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. 
You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Here ends the reading. Brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In years past, I've served as a college chaplain on two different large college campuses. During those years, I met numbers of students who set out upon the task of reading the Bible from cover to cover. Sometimes they were new to the faith, and sometimes they had grown up in the church but found a new interest in knowing God when they left home and met others from a variety of religious experiences. It was a joy to walk with these students who were energetic and full of questions. And I can say this, unlike your campus pastor, I was a lot younger then, so he's still got a lot of energy going. But I loved that the students were always seeking to know more. I love that about my seminary students now. And these college students, some of them were incredibly enthusiastic about the faith, and they wanted to be able to share more with their friends who had not yet come to know God or heard his word. They were discovering the joy that comes from Christian fellowship and service in God's name. And like Christians all around the world, they wanted to read and know the Bible. And so some of them would set out on that task of reading the Bible from beginning to end. They would start out by reading the wonderful stories that are given to us in the opening chapters of Genesis. They would marvel when they saw God breathe life into the universe. They would picture God forming a man from the dust of the earth and breathing life into his nostrils. They would try to imagine the depth of the water of the flood and the height of the Tower of Babel. And then they would follow Abraham and his family, and they would learn what it means to be called by faith, to leave home and to follow a promise, a holy promise. They might laugh with Sarah, and some of them would even laugh at Sarah. They would ruminate about the family dynamics of Joseph and his brothers, which, if one takes the time, finds them as intriguing, as intriguing as the best of today's reality TV. When they reached the book of Exodus and entered into the life of Moses, they met all the people that God used to bring him safely into this life. His mother, his sister, two cunning Hebrew midwives, and even the daughter of Pharaoh. And when at last they heard the cry, let my people go so they might worship the Lord in the wilderness, that is, worship the Lord God in freedom. And the Hebrews were brought through the Red Sea. These avid readers of the word did not want to put this book down. The God who set this world in motion the one who created the first man and the first woman, was leading his people in every way. And then, then they would get to the book of Leviticus and promptly fall asleep. All that enthusiasm would fade away in just a flash. Paragraph after paragraph, page after page, were filled with instructions about ancient Israel's worship. I can only describe it 
like reading a manual to fix a black and white television from the 1950s when you're trying to set up Netflix on your new 70-inch flat screen. Our television and our technology have changed drastically, and the instructions don't appear to be helpful to us at all. So that either reading the book of Leviticus becomes our cure for insomnia, or we begin to skim the pages until at last we reach the book of Numbers, where we can read with growing interest about all that happened to the children of Israel in the wilderness. Now to be sure, most of Leviticus is a difficult read. But tucked into the end of the book is a section that is called the Holiness Code. Better than the Da Vinci Code, by the way. The Holiness Code, where we learn the importance of what it means to live in right relationships with others and how those relationships are rooted in God's relationship with us all. There is a connection between all those ethical laws, laws that tell us how to live with each other, and the laws that define how we worship God. Chapter 19, the passage we heard today, comes right at the center of the Holiness Code. And it's a part of the Holy Scriptures that is very much like the Ten Commandments where the laws tell us who it is that we are to worship and how that trust in God is to be lived out in every moment of our lives. The commandments were given for the community's protection, for the community's welfare. And I believe that they were truly given as an expression of divine justice so that we would be protected from the evil that we often wish to do to one another. So the word of God in Leviticus 19 instructs us, you shall not reap to the edges of your field nor take the gleanings. You shall not strip the vineyards bare. You have enough. There are those who don't. Make provision for the poor, for the starving, for those who have no land of their own and no way to feed their families. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not use God's name to your own advantage, pretending that his love for you is greater than his love for anybody else. When you pretend that you are telling the truth about someone's life and you are really lying, you are offending the one who made that life the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. You shall not defraud your neighbor. That means no cheating, no deceiving, no conning, no scheming, no profiteering, no using other people's labor to line your own pocketbook to make your own life more comfortable at their expense. You shall not revile the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind. Our culture has only recently begun to understand that everyone, regardless of physical abilities, has the right to pursue life in the greater community. When the only access to classrooms was a flight of steps, it took someone brave to say, my friend can't climb these. We need to make these rooms more accessible. 
when blind men and women could not cross busy streets. It took someone who cared for their neighbor to work towards installing auditory crossing signals. It was only a generation ago when we did not have signers who would dance and speak the word of God for those who are hearing impaired so they too could praise God in fullness. Our world is just beginning to understand what God has understood all along, that all his children are of infinite value. God is reminding us here in Leviticus that it is he and he alone who creates life and that every life that he creates was made in his image and his likeness. Our Lord Jesus will echo these words time and time again. For whatever you do to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you do unto me. Until he at last who commanded us not to profit by the blood of our neighbor will spill his own blood for us. In the holiness code of Leviticus, the power of the commandments are brought home, given a living shape in a web of relationships in which we all engage. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. Our Lord Jesus will ask us in many ways, who is your neighbor and who is your family, your kin? As he hangs on the cross, he will expand and redefine the limitations we've put on who is our kin. And I, he says, and I, when I am lifted up, will draw all people to myself. His body will define our body as we become one body in him. And just in case we've missed the point, he will send his own beloved mother into a disciple's home where she will henceforth live as a member of another's family. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin just as the commandment says, you shall not kill. And just as our Lord Jesus says, you have heard that it was said in those ancient times, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. So we learn that the first step to breaking that sacred commandment begins long before we pick up a knife or a gun or herd millions of naked, terrified people into structures that look like showers and pump hydrogen cyanide into their lungs until their bodies fall lifeless on the ground. We don't come to murder in an instant but through nurturing a hatred in our hearts for our kin. Because before any of us can kill, we generally need to hate, and we often need to lie. And then we also have to be ready to justify our actions at someone else's expense. This is how we create scapegoats. In order to kill someone, we need to believe in some way that they are not as worthy of life as we are. That's why people call each other by derogatory names. It's a preliminary step to pulling a trigger 
or to leaving a toxic waste dump in the poorest of our communities, or to herding people onto barren reservation lands, or to leaving thousands upon thousands of refugee children to spend their childhood in disease-infested tent cities, their bodies wasting away without adequate food or even a drop of clean, cool water, their bones stunted forever beyond repair. The holiness code says no to us. No to every time we t seek to take the sin that infects our heart and paint a picture of it on someone else's face. The holiness code says no to us when we believe that we are the only ones who are good and blameless and worthy of this world's riches. The holiness code says no to us when we think we can do anything we want to anyone else, because after all, we don't believe that they really deserve to live. And so, for our sake, the holiness code says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he who is the fountain of all holiness, he who is the living embodiment of the holiness code, he in whom all holiness is fulfilled, he gives his holiness to us. Because on our own, we can't even bear to read it, let alone live it out. And through this same holy love, he gives us to one another, all people holy and precious in his sight. The power to speak his love, the power to say no when we see your brother or sister acting in destructive ways, the power to trust and obey all come from the one who says, I am the Lord. May you find shelter in the embrace of his love. May your eyes be open to care for those who are most in need. And may you live out his holiness in every relationship that he places before you in love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.